Okay, we're now going to talk about chapters two and three, which is Jesus' personal message to seven churches in uh, mid-Asia uh, or medio persia and to uh, really to all churches uh, down the ages. So before we get started in that, there, Revelations itself could be broken up into three different major sections or major key actions uh, that are taken by God uh, in the book of Revelation. First is uh, God's dealing with the church. Uh, that might come as a surprise, but he deals with the church before he deals with the world. Second is going to be God's dealing with the world. And then third is going to be the reign of Jesus Christ in God's kingdom, the new heaven and new earth that he's going to establish. So starting with God's dealing with the church. First Peter 4 explains it quite well. He says, for the time for judgment to begin with God's household, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should be should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And that's probably the most best advice right there. We need to continue to do good, to persevere to the end. First Peter 3.17, <clears throat> for it is better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Wow, that's an interesting concept, and we'll, we'll get more into this. So Jesus instructs John to write, shall we say, seven open performance appraisal letters to seven churches. And uh, every one of these seven letters basically follows the same format, that first and foremost, he introduces himself with a very unique appearance of himself. And, uh, and this appearance, like uh, I'm the Alpha and Omega, blah, 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 this usually gives a, a key to what he's going to say next to that particular church. Then there is usually accommodation. Um, and it starts off with, I know your deeds. Very important. And then there's usually a but. And that is his rebuke. And it's given in love, but it is also designed to correct and bring this church and its members to maturity. And then after this rebuke, Jesus gives a very specific remedy. So with the problem that God gives, he also gives a specific solution. And then last but not least, he gives a promise to him who overcomes or to him who is victorious. And usually the greater the problem that's in the church, the greater is this promise or this word of encouragement. Now, lots of times we will take this as a, a um, promise to this particular church, but when we look at it, it's really universal promises. The important thing here though, is that all the churches, are invited to learn from Jesus' warnings to these seven particular churches. So it's important for all of us to pay attention to what Jesus has to say. Now in these key messages, um, he starts off saying, to the angel of the church end. Now the angel is singular, talking about one individual. And there's all sorts of different interpretations of what this angel means. I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to tell you what I believe it says. I think it is addressed to the person responsible for the whole church. Um, in today's vernacular, that would be the senior pastor of the church. 
And then he goes on to say, I know your deeds. And that's given word for word to five churches. And then the other two, kind of the same, uh, but worded a little different. Then he goes into something that's very, very important. Whoever has ears, let him them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And this is given verbatim to all seven churches. So it's really, really important. And then he'll end with, to the one who is victorious, or he who is who overcomes, or he who wins the victory, or the one who conquers. Now, even though this is all given uh, uh, to the letter to a church, it's a singular promise to the one, singular. He is singular. And this is also given to all seven churches. So I know your deeds. This is something that uh, it just really hits home. Uh, this is the introduction of five out of the seven churches. And for the other two churches, it's, it's pretty much the same message. And we'll see that it's implied just with a slightly different phrase. But our deeds, Jesus makes no bones about this. Our deeds, whether individually or corporately in the church, are important in the eyes of God. And they carry either rewards or chastisement. Uh, I think Jesus said it well uh, in Revelation 2.23, where he says, then all the churches, all the churches yesterday and today and tomorrow will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds, according to our actions, according to what we, we make of ourselves and do in our life, uh, both corporately and as individuals. So this is very, very important. Deeds are important. Now, I just read Revelations 2.23, but let me read three other scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all, each and every one of us, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You know, so often we think of it as bad, but also with deeds, there's rewards as well. Uh, Ephesians 2.10, we are God's handiwork, each and every one of us. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And then Romans 14, 12 does a, summarizes where it says, then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And as we know, based on our hearts, our minds, and what we do with that, our deeds, our actions. So people have to ask the question, and it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, relevant question. Do deeds place one in jeopardy of their salvation? Okay, we could really go into a theological debate here, but let me just subscribe to Scripture interpreting Scripture. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10. By the grace God has given me, I lay a foundation as a wise builder, I being Paul here, and someone else is building on it. But each one, that's talking to each and every one of us, should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. And if anyone builds on this foundation using gold and silver and costly stones or wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, the day being that day of judgment, the day of rewards, that day, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what he has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if it's burned up, listen to this, the builder will suffer loss but yet will be saved. Okay, 
You think, oh, that's great news. And it is good news. But Paul goes on to say, even though only as one escaping through the flames. So deeds are important. Deeds are not attached to our salvation, but let's say deeds are the fruit of our true selves. And as we said earlier, uh, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So another key message, each and every church was told whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is given not only in verbatim to all seven churches, even though there is one church where there's, a, there's an addition added to it, but these are universal messages and they apply to all churches throughout the church age, and, but maybe even more directly to the churches at the end of the age. And let's look at some important scriptures. Revelations 1.3. We had already talked about this in chapter one, but I'll reiterate. Blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. Jesus said in Matthew 13, for this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. So what are you saying here? There is superficial hearing and then there's genuine hearing. In other words, genuine because I understand Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior and his words are life and I need to pay attention and obey what? He has to say. And on the subject of obedience, I'm going to jump down to the, the last verse in John 8, 31, 32, because so often we hear, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And don't you want to be, don't you want to know the truth and be set free? Yes, I do. Absolutely. But so often we forget the first verse to the Jews who had believed him. That's, these are believing Jews. Uh, so he's not trying to sell who he is. Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So um, obedience is crucial in all this. And the book of Revelation pretty much ends on chapter 22 where Jesus says, look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecy written in this scroll. So whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit has to say. And then there's this very, very important, consistent message. He, he being a, an individual um, who overcomes, or to the one, once again, singular, who is victorious, um, the word is Nikael. Um, that's kind of where we get the brand name Nike from. He who overcomes or is victorious. But anyway, there's a profound conditional blessing to him, to individuals who overcome. And consequently, obviously bad news to those who do not overcome. I think 1 John 5, uh, verses 4 and 5, does a wonderful job of explaining this. Where he says, for everyone born of God, overcomes the world. This is the victory. This is the Nikael that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is that that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus, that Yeshua is the son of God. Very important. Now, one thing I think it's worth noting is that there seems to be a direct correlation between the overcomer and, and the Beatitudes that uh, Jesus taught uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. So stop and think about it. Who's an overcomer? Look at Matthew 5. Well, I think it's theirs is the kingdom of God. They're, that's overcoming. Uh, they will be comforted. They will inherit the earth. That's definitely an overcomer. They will be filled. They'll be shown mercy. 
That's an overcomer. They will see God. They will be called children of God. And once again, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who's this? Those who are poor in spirit. Those who mourn. Who mourn their, their, their spiritual bankruptcy before God. Uh, who are meek. Not weak. Meek. Uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those who are merciful to others. Those who are pure in their heart. Those who are peacemakers. And those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And we will see persecution because of righteousness is a big theme in the book of Revelation. But these are the overcomers. Uh, and all seven churches, I already said, are given a he who overcomes message, but including two churches that there was no rebuke. There was nothing wrong found uh, in, in their performance appraisal. So what do we, what's the takeaway on this? What matters, what really matters is how we live our life in relationship to the events and the pressures that we face every day. Um, we're always pressured to do something that we know internally is not right. But how we respond makes all the difference in the world. We're living in very serious times. I mean, let's, let's, let's make no bones about it. Very serious times economically, politically, socially. Uh, and there are many moral challenges on a daily basis. But each and every event, keep this in mind, each and every event, each pressure that we face, each temptation that we face, it's really a crossroad. And the crossroad is going to, you know, uh, where we either become an overcomer or we are overcome, which leads to defeat, which is exactly where Satan wants us. So if we do not become overcomers in the little things in life, in the daily things in life, how in the world do we stand a chance in the tribulations that the future holds? Uh, not only the tribulation of, of just daily life, uh, especially as uh, the last days, things are getting worse and worse, but also uh, in the great tribulation itself. Um, if we're not prepared um, and already battle-hardened overcomers in the daily pressures, how in the world are we going to survive? John 16, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And in this world, that's the promise, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I, the Lord Jesus Christ, has overcome the world. And that's the reason why we need to lean heavily on Jesus and his word and his promises and obeying what he has to say. So how does one overcome the world? And for those that are around during the Antichrist, how do you overcome the Antichrist? Well, in Revelation 12, 11, it clearly states, and they overcame him, him's the Antichrist. Well, how? Because of the blood of the lamb, because of what he did on the cross, because we are positionally righteous before God and Satan, neither Satan nor the Antichrist can ever, never, never take that away. So because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, our testimony is vitally important in this. Never give up. Always stand your ground. Stand firm, as, as uh, Paul said as in, in Ephesians 6. And they did not love their life, even when faced with death. We as a Western church have a hard time comprehending this. But the global church, this is a big reality in their life. And who knows, it might be a reality in our lives, but um, they did not love their life even when faced with death. And what are the rewards of being an overcomer? Well, Revelation ends in chapter 21, seven, where it says, he who overcomes shall, inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. Inherit what? 
God's kingdom, citizens in God's kingdom, part of his family, um, the marriage of the lamb. Uh, it just goes on and on. It just doesn't get any better than this. So it's important. It's important that we're overcomers and that we're victorious. Okay, so having said that, let's get into the letters themselves. First one, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Right. Now, Ephesus, by the way, is a church that we're pretty familiar with because there's a letter to the Ephesians, right? In the part of the New Testament epistles. Anyway, here, correction, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds. We're going to see this time and time again. I know your deeds. Okay. And in this case, they're all good. They're good. Your hard work. Now, the difference between work and hard work, uh, just, just a little trivia information. Uh, work is copos. And so if it's work, it's copos. But if it's, if it's repeated, and, and this also happens in Hebrew, if it's copos, copos, it's not only work, it's hard work. I know your hard work, your labor, your wearisome labor, uh, your toil. Um, I know your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. So this is a healthy, holy church, right? You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered. You have endured hardships for my name. And you have not grown weary. Like I said, this is, the deeds here are just solid. Something that a church can, can, can be proud of coming from the Lord Jesus Christ saying this. And then he goes on. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Kind of like snuffing the life out. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in paradise of God. So let's unpack this a little bit. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you've had at first. Or in NASB, you have left your first love. So left what love? Loving God, loving each other. Uh, that's probably a, a little bit of a yes, yes on both counts. Matthew 22, uh, explain, Jesus explained love big time. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This, loving your God, is the first and the greatest commandment. So that's very important love. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law. And the prophets hang on these two commandments. So this is important big time. And if you've forsaken that, you will disappoint God. And just an FYI, uh, before Jesus departed, he updated the love your neighbor as yourself. He changed it. John 13, 34, he says, a new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Well, that's a little heavier than just loving our neighbor as ourself. This is loving one another as, as Jesus Christ, for God so loved his world that he gave his only begotten son, right? So this is a very deep and profound love. But is that all there is? And the reason why I ask the question is because, first and foremost, this is given 
to the leadership in the church of Ephesus and read, and read out loud to the whole congregation. And it wasn't even explained. It just says you've left your first love. And you know the congregation knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. So there's one more thing that might also be added. Since this is to the church in, in Ephesus, the Ephesians, uh, let's go to Ephesians and just see if there's anything else that might need to be addressed in all this. Ephesians chapter four, starting verse 17, where Paul says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. Now that's strong language that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Ooh, so we might be talking about sexual immorality here. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And back then, uh, we gotta remember that the pagan temples had the temple prostitutes uh, with all sorts of sexual acts going on. But then later on he says, in your anger do not sin. Well, lots of times that is addressed to husband and wives. So maybe we got marital relationships as well. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. And he goes on, he says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, uh, just as Christ forgave you. Okay, that's like loving our fellow man, loving our neighbor. But then he goes on and says, live a life of love, just as Christ loved does, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality. Okay, now we're back to sexual immorality. Uh, chapter five, uh, that was uh, verses two and three. And then following up in verses, starting verse 22, he goes on to say, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. And that's a very important part of a healthy marriage relationship. However, however, what may be at the heart of the problem starts in the very next verse. Husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself. So there may be many facets on Jesus' rebuke to the church of Ephesus that you've left your first love. So let's move on. One important thing, you know, once again, it's important to look at the words carefully because each and every word is the inerrant word of God and it's there for a reason and a purpose. Jesus says, you have left your first love. He did not say you have lost your first love, only that you have left. It's almost like a voluntary action, which means you know how to return to your first love. You know how to, to regain your first love. And I think this is very, very important. So, he summarizes, <clears throat> whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who's victorious or to the overcomer. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, a couple of references uh, on this uh, out of Revelation. Revelation 22, 14, blessed are those who wash their robes, okay, that they may have the right to the tree of light and may go through the gates into the city. Okay, and what's this washing robes bit? Well, if you recall in Ephesians 5, verse 26, where Jesus was talking about to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, through God's word. We read also in Titus 3, 5, he saved us not because of the righteous thing we had done. Obviously, our, 
all that we do is like filthy rags in the eye in, in the context of, of salvation. But because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Okay, maybe washing their robes uh, now is, is taking on a much better meaning. And, and the right to eat the tree of life, which we're beginning to see is, is as Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, there's a condition here. You gotta be an overcomer. Um, Revelation 22, 19. If anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this scroll. Now, I think the important takeaway in that verse is that God's word is important. God's word is life. We need to take God's word very, very seriously and we should never ever try to take away or add to the, the message that God is telling us. And this is obviously a, a very uh, pointed um, thing to take note of to those who teach with God's word. Okay, let's move on. That was Ephesus. Now to the angel of the church in Smyrna. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions. Okay, he doesn't say I know your deeds, but in one sense he's saying that. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and they're not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, let's unpack this because there's some very, very important things here. Okay, first of all, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Wow, we're gonna see later on the flip side of this. But for now, we're focused on Smyrna. You're poor, you're afflicted, but yet you're rich. And one sense this really goes against um, the wealth and prosperity doctrine that is popular in so many Western churches, especially here in America. And the truth is there are times when we need to be put in a place where we have no choice but to trust in him entirely these are faith-building circumstances. And whether we see it or not, we come out of it rich and blessed in the kingdom of God. Mark 10, starting verse 17. As Jesus, and this is a very important uh, lesson here. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him, Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I've done since I'm a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad, because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, 
how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, I wish we had more time to really unpack this, but what he's not saying is that it's bad to be wealthy. That's not it at all. But what do you place your trust in? What do you place your hope in? What do you cling on to tighter than anything else in life? Psalms 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. So I guess in today's vernacular, that could be our, our uh, SUVs and our Ferraris, right? But we trust in the name of Yahweh, our God. One thing we need to take note is that there, were, there wasn't a single rebuke to this church. It was all good. And yet they were not rescued from their suffering. Because what did Jesus say? He says, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. It's going to get worse, church. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. So be faithful even to the point of death. There's not a rescue here. The rewards that you're earning, they will be in my kingdom, right? Okay, a couple of things to keep in mind here. He says... Um, you're going to suffer persecution for 10 days. So at least it wasn't going to be a permanent persecution. It was only going to be a short time. Um, and we've talked about it earlier. Sometimes painful or humiliating suffer, suffering is needed to strengthen us. Okay, I'll put as an example Peter's three denials. There towards the end, what? We all know Peter was getting cocky. Uh, and, you know, uh, he was a... Uh, he was a man of attitude, shall we say, in today, today's vernacular. And that's not bad because strong will, if applied correctly, is wonderful for the kingdom of God. But Jesus saw what was in Peter's heart and that he needed to suffer before he could be strong. And then, of course, you know, we're told Peter before the cock uh, crows three times, you will deny me three times. And as we know, Peter wept bitterly. But what came out of it? It was not a defeated Peter. It was a determined Peter to stand firm, to stand up for God, to stand against the, the religious leadership today that were against the Messiah uh, without faltering. He was stronger for it. So sometimes we have to suffer. And it's part of preparing us for what lays in the future. Um, once again, 2 Timothy 3.1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. It's not going to get better. Okay, let's move on. To the angel of the church in Pergamum. These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Okay, that already tells us something a little more serious is going to come. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Remember, in this day and age, the pagan temples, there was a lot of sexual immorality and, and, and temple prostitutes and um, um, orgies, for lack of better words. Likewise, you, have, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Whoa, repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 
Ah, there's the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who's victorious. I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Okay, so let's unpack this a little more. I know where you live. Okay, this is, a, this is one of the two, uh, uh, two variants of other than I know your deeds. So he starts off saying, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. So these are very positive things, uh, uh, strong uh, qualities of the church. Uh, Pergamum, by the way, was the headquarters of the ba Babylonian priesthood. So it was already very, very pagan. But it was also the center of worship of Asclepius, the god of medicine, uh, and that was pictured in the form of a serpent. So almost like Satan himself, where Satan has his throne. And yet a church had been established right under their noses. So uh, Jesus Christ is saying, good on you. Good on you, Church of Pergamon. Yet. And before we hit the yet, remember the beginning. These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. That is already set in the stage that something, shall we say, painful is coming. Um, Hebrews 4.12, uh, talking about the sharp double-edged sword. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly and handles or um, in King James, rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? If it's not rightly dividing, there's gonna be a sharp two-edged sword that will divide. That's what Jesus is saying. Because he goes on and says, I got a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Notice he did not say, you've accepted this teaching and you believe in the teachings of Balaam, but more importantly, especially in the context of the church, you are allowing and harboring people who believe this doctrine. This is a serious problem with church leadership. This is the reason why Church leadership is so important in our church today and leadership that lets political correctness creep in uh, and we can go on and on with the whole list there. That is serious. It should not be tolerated. It should not be tolerated by leadership in particular, but also we as saints must uh, stand firm against it. Don't you know, as Paul says, a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough. That's how dangerous this is. And Jesus Christ was not happy. All right. Okay, enough of that. I think we got that black and white. To the one who's victorious, I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Okay, what's this white stone thing? Well, I figured we need to explain that a little. Three thoughts of uh, different applications of white stones in that day of age. They were used as an admission ticket to public festivals. So in other words, it was like buying a ticket to the rodeo or to the carnivore. The, and the, so the new name could be the believer's new name or the Messiah's new name. So in other words, it was their ticket to the kingdom of God. White stones were given to winners of Roman races. And that's another uh, good analogy of our Christian walk uh, because narrow is the gate that leads to life, right? Uh, Paul says, you know, he, he strived to run the race, to cross that finish line. 
Such white stones have a personal name inscribed, which presumably act as a unique entrance pass to prestigious banquets or other events. So these winners of these Roman races, they were given a white stone that had their name on it. And then uh, what happens usually after every big sporting event is all the parties, right? And guess what? They have a carte blanche invitation. Uh, put this in a spiritual perspective. You have a carte blanche invitation into the kingdom of God. But last but not least, and all three of these are relevant, white stones were used by jurors to cast their vote for acquittal or if they were guilty, it was a black stone. And through Jesus Christ, we are given a white stone, not guilty. Very, very powerful. Okay, so that was Pergamon. Now let's go on to the church in Thyatria. These are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Uh-oh, we know what's coming. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. He knows our deeds, our love, our faith, our service, our perseverance, and that we're doing more than we did at first. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. This church has an active ministry and they're doing excellent things. However, good works do not compensate for something that is structurally wrong or governmentally wrong or incorrect. So Jesus goes on to say, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate, you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. And by her teaching, she's misleading my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. So, you know, Jesus is saying, you haven't dealt with her, so I've dealt with her. I will strike her children dead. And then listen, then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and the minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. He goes on to say, now I say to the rest of you in Thyatria, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come, to persevere, to be an overcomer, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. So as what's been delegated to me, I have the privilege of delegating to you. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So some important points here. First and foremost, most likely Jezebel was not her name. But everybody in the church knew who Jezebel the prophetess was, even though that wasn't her name. The point here is that, the, that calling her Jezebel drives home just how serious this sin is in the eyes of God. And like the previous church in Pergamum, Jesus is angry that church leadership is allowing this to happen. This church has weak, intimidated, or and compromised leadership. It's as simple as that. And he will hold them accountable. Okay? So church leadership, church government, it's important to the church back then. It's important to the church today. Okay? Now he goes on and he says, to the one who is victorious, or in other translations, to the overcomer. But here he adds to it. 
So instead of just saying to the one who's victorious, I will do this and that, he says to the one who's victorious and does my will to the end. So this is like a, a con, adding a, an additional um, uh, requirement, uh, a condition to the blessing, but it's not really different than what's already throughout the, the Bible and the New Testament. But this is just a reiteration to the church, to the congregation, Thyatria. You need to do my will to the end, okay? Uh, now, why was this? We don't know. Um, but uh, there's, like I said, there's a whole bunch of scripture. I, I put a, a slew of scripture here that makes that point that God rewards those who are faithful to his word, but even more importantly, Remaining faithful to the end is absolutely critical to one's salvation. Whoa, are you kidding me? No, I'm not. Um, the, the, the word of God is very, very clear. And of course, you hear the argument of the Calvinists or the Armenians. Well, they're both very clear on this. And the only difference is the Calvinists will say, well, he never was saved. And the Armenians would say, uh, belief would say, he chose to stray off the path. Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But listen, small is the gate, narrow is the road that leads to life. That's not life, but it leads to life at the end of the trail. And only few find it. Matthew 10, 22, he goes on to say, you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. In all of it discourse, Matthew 24, he says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So doing his will to the end is of utmost importance. Mark 13, 13, everyone will hate you because of me. And this will be especially relevant in the latter days and especially, especially, especially relevant during the times of the great tribulation. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So it's very, very important. Uh, he goes on to say, I will give authority over nations. Um, uh, and that one will rule them with an iron scepter and dash them like pieces of pottery, uh, just as I receive authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Jesus, he's telling us he will share, he will delegate uh, his rule with his people. Remember in Genesis, Genesis chapter one, where God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, Okay, part of God's likeness is he's a ruler so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, livestock, and all wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Psalms 8, 6, you made them rulers. Who's them? That's members of God's kingdom. Over the works of your hands, you put everything under their feet. And as for the morning star, well, Jesus, he's talking about himself. Uh, in Numbers 24, 17, remember um, uh, Balaam's prophecy where he says, I see him being the Messiah, but not now. He's off in the future. I behold him, but he's not near. Once again, he's off in the future. And then he said, prophesies, a star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And he will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. So that's backed into the seat of the woman prophecies that we had uh, looked at earlier. Revelations 22, last chapter. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. So Jesus Christ is talking about himself here. Okay, let's move on. We're going to take a little different approach here. 
uh, to the angel of the church of Sardis. And we'll kind of flesh it out as we read it. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God. Oh, the seven spirits of God that roam throughout the earth. Uh, we've already talked about this, but what God is emphasizing here is that there's nothing hidden from the all seen. So you cannot fool me. And the seven stars, I hold the churches in my hands. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive. Okay. Maybe that's a past reputation. Uh, uh, reputation, maybe that's a current reputation of how they see themselves. Uh, it's possible that they lost their first love. We're not quite sure, but we got some strong hints. But you are currently dead. You're dead. You're complacent. You're apathetic. Wake up. Okay, that's command number one. So let's call it step one to the recovery. Strengthen what remains. That would be step two. And is about to die. Much of this church is close to a spiritual death. This is serious. For I have found your deeds unfinished. So what you're currently doing is unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember step three. Therefore, what you have received and heard, hold it fast. Repent. That would be step four. And then he goes on to say, but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know what time I will come to you. Okay, this is addressed to individuals, not necessarily as a church as a whole. If you do not wake up, I'm going to come like a thief. I'm going to snuff out your light. Yet you have a few people, see, once again, it, it shows us, well, he's talking to individuals in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Wow, that's being brutally honest. They will walk with me dressed in white. And as we have read previously in Revelation, that represents the righteous acts of God's holy people. For they are worthy. Therefore, to the one who is victorious like them, be dressed, will like them be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. Okay, it's almost talking like there's people that are, um, they could be blocked out of the, of the book of life. This is quite serious. But we'll acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Remember right now, he's a high priest on the order of Melchizedek. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. So one question we can ask is, can God re revive such a church? Can God revive a dead church? Because we know there's a lot of dead churches out there, regrettably. There's a lot of churches that are more like mausoleums than anything else. Well, let me just say this. Now, I know this is individuals, but uh, Samson was restored. King David was restored after the horrendous crimes he committed. Peter was restored, as we'd already talked about. So yes, he can revive a dead church. Uh, uh, an accompanying scripture in Proverbs, I think, is, uh, is relevant here. Proverbs 24, starting verse 10, if you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death and hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew, knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? So what is uh, God saying here in Proverbs? What he's saying is that we all have a responsible role. If we seen people that are straying off the path, that, uh, uh, shall we say, they're dying spiritually, we need to reach out to them. We need to help them. Um, and that's part of our role and responsibility in, in the body of Christ. That's what, the reason why it's called body ministry. All right? Okay, let's move on.
To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door, opportunities. Now, first and foremost, uh, when he says uh, he opened, what he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. Those are direct quote, quotes out of Isaiah 22, 22, which uh, was quoted uh, in Acts as well. But then he says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door. Well, what's an open door is normally for us. There are opportunities that nobody can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word. You've not denied my name. I will make those of the, who are the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they're not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, once again, he who overcomes, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who's victorious or to the overcomer, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven, from my God. And I will also write on them my new name so whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, first and foremost, we need to know this is another church where there are not, there's not a single rebuke given to this church. Not one. Okay, I would like to say it's all good, but at least it's not bad. A similar word of encouragement found in 1 Peter 1. Verse three, praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, which this church was experiencing. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Strong words of encouragement. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy the peace that passes all understanding. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So a very similar word of encouragement. Okay, in this is verse 10. And this verse has all sorts of interpretations. Uh, and this is one verse that, for those that believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. In other words, the whole church is going to be raptured out at any second now, um, and we're resulting in planes with no pilots and cars with no drivers, that sort of thing, um, have used as, as pretty much the primary verse for the rapture. So let's dissect this a little closer. Since you've kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. So keep you from, now are we talking the rapture or are we talking something like the Goshen principle, if you recall in, in Exodus? Um, 
And the hour of trial, well, yeah, trial, temptation, calamity, affliction. affliction. So uh, the question is, are we talking about the great tribulation here? Because it goes on to say that is going to come to, on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Okay. So what's, first and foremost, what's the you here? Well, the pre-tribbers will say the you is the church. It's the whole church. Uh, but that doesn't seem to apply to all true believers in the world at the end of the age. On the contrary, the trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth seems to indicate that the universal church, for example, remember the church in Smyrna? They had no rebukes from Jesus, but yet they were undergoing these trying times. So let's look at some scripture in the context of the great tribulation. Daniel 7, 21. As I watch this horn, that being the Antichrist. Remember, the great tribulation comes out of the Antichrist. Very, very important. This is the wrath of Satan using the Antichrist and the false prophet against Israel, the Hebrew people, and the church which we will definitely get into detail. But anyway, as I watched this horn, the Antichrist was waging war against the holy people. And he was defeating them. Mm, they were still around. Revelations 13, 7. It, once again, it is the Antichrist, was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. So once again, um, the Antichrist is attacking the saints, the church. It's a very important principle to note here. Um, the saints, uh, not the church as a whole, which keep verse 10, uh, which keep, which we see in, in uh, verse 10, Jesus' command to endure patiently, the overcomers, will be kept from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So what is the keep you from? The phrase keep you from most likely means not removal from, like a rapture out, but protection from, or protection throughout the great tribulation. Um, lots of scripture here, but just like the Goshen principle in Exodus, which we talked about earlier um, a, a few classes back. So let's unpack some of these verses. John 17, 14 through 15. This is Jesus Christ in his prayer to his father, right? I have given them your word. That's my followers, my disciples, my believers. And the world has hated them. The world has hated them. And I think we we're beginning to experience more and more this worldly hatred to Christians. For they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, that would be like a rapture, but that you protect them from the evil one. Uh, he goes on to say in verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Okay, I pray for those who believe in me through their message. These are the others that are they're freaking out because of the great tribulation. And some will harden their hearts. Others will turn to God. And those who turn to God, hopefully the church, the, the church is there to step up solid Christian believers and can show them the way to Jesus Christ. Show them the way to the kingdom of God. Uh, that's, that's the those who will believe in me, future, through their message. First John 5.18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe. And the evil one cannot harm them. So in other words, keep them from. Now, having said that, there are going to be many saints that will be 
persecuted, that will be slaughtered, in particular beheaded throughout Revelation. However, a case in point of divine protection could be found as an example with what God did with the 144,000 Jews, who they're kind of like the first fruits. Of, this is the Jewish side of the house. We're kind of focused on the, Christ, on the church side right now. But this is a case in point where 144,000 Jews uh, were provided with a seal on their foreheads that protected them from God's wrath. Okay, now we're not talking about the Great Tribulation. We're talking beyond. Great Tribulation is Satan's wrath through the Antichrist and the false prophet. We're talking now, they're going to be protected from God's wrath. Okay, these are Jewish people that have not accepted Messiah yet. Well, they have not accepted Yeshua as their Messiah. It's found in Revelation 7, verse 1 and 4. Uh, where it says, after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and sea. Do not harm the land or the sea yet or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. And so it's like 12,000 from each tribe. Now, okay, you say, well, yeah, okay, that's uh, Jews, the Jewish people who have not accepted uh, Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, as their Messiah, uh, and uh, they're, shall we say, the first fruits of the great revival among the Jews. What about us, the church? Well, my take on that is Ephesians 4.30, where it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So we already have that seal, that marking from God. Okay, so that ends Philadelphia. Let's go to Laodicea. Um, once again, we'll just kind of unpack as we go. These are the words of the amen. Okay, amen, so be it. In other words, unquestionable truth, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So once again, this is coming uh, from somebody who is absolute authority, and I'm gonna give you unquestionable facts. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, so because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Quite a reality check here. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so you can see. And then he goes on and says, those whom I love, I rebuke. Just like he's rebuking this church viciously right now. And I discipline it. But, those whom I love, I rebuke. So Jesus is not giving up on this church. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. Notice he's standing on the door and knocking. He's on the outside. They're on the inside of the church. Crazy. But that's the way it, way it is. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, so they're inside the church and they open the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, we've had some churches where there was nothing wrong. Here is a church where there's nothing good. There's not a single accommodation of any good deed to this church. Whoa. Okay, let's unpack it. 
They say, I'm rich, I've required a wealth, and I do not need a thing. But Jesus says quite the opposite. You're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Okay, first and foremost, Laodicea was a wealthy banking and commercial center. I used to live in a in Singapore, which was a wealthy banking and commercial center, so I could understand the richness of material wealth. And this Laodicea was considered to be one of the richest cities in the world and at that time. It was also famous for its clothing manufacturing business. Okay, that brings a lot of wealth and shall we say high society type recognition. It was also a medical center with a famous medical university. So academic in, in academia, it was a gemstone. So they were wealthy banking, commercial center, they were clothing manufacturing business, uh, they were medical center, they had a famous medical uh, university. So by world's definition, this was a city of wealth, and obviously this had to be a wealthy church. I'm sure it was not, um, it was not a simple building. I'm sure it just exuded wealth. And the church members were probably very self-centered and confident in their riches. That's what they were putting their, their faith and trust in. Remember, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. But what? We will trust in the name of our God. In 61 AD, the city was destroyed by an earthquake. And Rome came in, because this is an important city in, in the eyes of the Roman government. They offered financial help to rebuild the city. But the Laodiceans... They said, no, we don't need your help, Rome. We will restore the city out of our own riches. Interesting. So, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. In spite of this harsh rebuke, this is a minister with genuine love. Jesus had no desire to reject the Laodicean church. In fact, he says, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. Once again, notice Jesus is on the outside, not the inside. That's a very sad story. He's shut out of his own place of worship. You know, the one place that we should see uh, Jesus, the presence of Jesus Christ is in his church, right? That wasn't the case here. And he says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is the heart of God. This is the reason why God says, I want you to love those as I love them. It's an amazing love that our Lord and Savior has. And sharing a meal back then was pretty much the same as today, a familiar practice of friendship, not rejection. God desires intimacy with his children. Very, very important message. Okay. So that's going to wrap up the seven letters. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, here's some of the things that the Spirit says. First of all, let's look at the noteworthy praises. Uh, you have kept my word. You have not denied my name. You have kept my command to endure patiently. You cannot tolerate wicked people. So very important. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans. You test those who claim to be apostles and found out that they're not. You're now doing more than you did at first. These are things, praises that we need to take note of and practice. We need to practice the best practices of the church as defined by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We also need to take a very close note of the rebukes to the seven churches. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. There are some among you that hold to the teaching of Balaam. You have also, uh, you have also, correction, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the neglation. So you're allowing leaven into the church. You're allowing ways of the world, the political correctness uh, uh, into our church. This is wrong. This is wrong. Leadership, you need to take note. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. That's another one. For I have found your deeds unfinished. You say to the rich, you say I am rich, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, 
fine and naked. So these are rebukes that we as a church need to take note and take to heart because this is God's assessment of his church. So in conclusion, I know your deeds. Deeds are a main subject in each and every one of these letters and they are vitally important. Confronting worldly teachings, worldly ways, political correctness that's found within the church today is important. That needs to be confronted. That leaven needs to be thrown out of the church. That goes hand in hand, hand, in hand with wrong association with bad people, with wrong doctrines. It's important. Remember, a little leaven spoils the whole lump of bread. Proper church leadership, proper church government. This is vitally important to the health of the church. Live in the present for God. Don't rely on past experiences. Well, remember the big revival we had at the turn of the century. Okay, that's fine. But what does it have to do with now? Don't rely on past experiences. And love the Lord. Love one another. So ministering to each other is vitally, vitally important. And last but not least, Run the race. Run the race to the end. Cross the finish line. Don't give up, even if you're weary, because he who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. So that wraps up chapters two and chapters three, what Jesus Christ has to say to his churches yesterday and today and in our future. Very, very important message from our Lord Jesus Christ. Next week, we will enter into the throne room of God. It will be a very, very, very exciting study. So until then, God bless.